Good morning, everyone. Good morning, welcome. Happy Mother's Day. Let's all stand and get ready to embrace. Awesome, let's look our hearts. Here, Lord, we just come before you, God, again, Lord. For your wonderful creation, Lord. Mothers, we thank you, Lord, that that you bless us, Lord, with loving and caring gifts. Supportive mothers, Lord. Women of faith, Lord. We praise you for that.
Amen, amen.
Calvary Chapel. Can we get some lights? I can't see. And apparently, whoever put my, my pulpit up here can't see either. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, where's my mom when I need her? <laughs> Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Chapel. Happy Mother's Day. Wow. We get to do this once a year, right? At least once a year, say Happy Mother's Day. <laughs> but every day we should honor our, our parents, right? It's actually one of the commandments that God has given us. Honor your father and mother. That should be in our very hearts. So before we get started, I just want to say this. There are two people in my life, my life, that have impacted me greatly. And those two people have been mothers. First, my mother, and then my wife, who is a mother to my boys. Um, I'm not saying anything else. You always have to preface these things with, with you know, hey, I'm not saying anyone, anyone else's mothers are not as good or anything like that. I'm just telling you what I have experienced, you know. So my mom is the best mom. I've known her all of my life. <laughs> I know some of you can say that. And she has just been such a blessing, and more so in the latter part of her life as she now lives with us. And just to get to know her, talk with her, eat lunch, breakfast, dinner with her, uh, has been a great pleasure for me in these last days of, of her life. And, and mine too, because I'm getting up there on the soul. So she's been the best mom. She has been through so much. And I tell you, um, for a person that didn't graduate elementary, <laughs> you know, she's a pretty smart person. She's a pretty smart person. And her hard work has paid off, and she's just a blessing to so many. So I thank God for her. And I thank God for my wife, <clears throat> who, who came along my side and helped me raise a good two, four good boys who have their own children. We have 11 grandchildren. And I tell you, she has been a pillar and a foundation in my life. I don't know of any other uh, wife like that, because I only have one wife, <laughs> and she's been a great mother to, to her boys, so uh, two people that just have impacted my life greatly, so let's open up our bulletins and quickly go through the announcements, the CCLE AI, of course you know our AI, artificial intelligence, uh, if you haven't done it yet, please do so, 85100. Text that, it will uh, then text you back when you put in CC Inland, and you can communicate. So we're still trying to figure out how it really works, at least I am, and hopefully it will help us communicate even more. See Carlos if you have any uh, questions concerning our CC AI. Um, our yard sale is coming up this coming Saturday, so if you haven't signed up, please sign up uh, to help out. We do need some people to help with uh, cooking, help you in the kitchen. So if you're interested, please see her. Men's retreat, uh, we're having a meeting on June 3rd at 6.30 here at the church, guys. So those of you that were involved and want to help out with that meeting uh, and that retreat, please join us on June 3rd. Uh, it looks like we're going to be heading up to Big Bear. Uh, we have some connections to some uh, places where we can stay. We're trying to see if we can get, have a place big enough for about 20 guys, which will be a blessing. And it'll be a neat time of retreat, fishing, fellowshipping, and so forth. Women's retreat meeting will be this coming Monday, the 13th. So ladies, some of you who have been involved in the past of the retreats, if you're interested in helping out with this, if we have a retreat or if we have a one-day conference, you know, we're just kind of meeting together to see what the Lord wants to do. So that will be tomorrow at 6.30. Men's conference will be Saturday, June 8th, in place of our luncheon. This will be at Calvary Chapel, Chino Valley. Raul Reese will be speaking, Dave Rosales, and another brother that will be sharing there. We're going to meet here at the church, and my mom is actually going to cook for us breakfast, uh, some specialty, good food, and then we're going to carpool down over there. So guys, uh, see Jose uh, and let him know that you're interested. We're going to get a count and I'm going to purchase all the tickets and then you can just reimburse the, the church. All right, if I can have the ushers come forward. If you do need the uh, any information, you can see it on the side of the, the bulletin there, a little fold in there. Uh, gives you uh, information on what's going on in the church welcomes visitors. Uh, we can see there's a little uh, warning there about disturbances. 
And while the church service is going on, you know, please keep all the disturbances down. Your cell phone should be off when you come into the church. If you do get up and, and leave, we would ask you to sit in the back just so that you don't cause any disturbances while the word is going on. Or sit outside, if you will, because we believe that the word of God is being taught. People are listening and being ministered to, and they need to hear what God is saying. And then we have your guest Wi-Fi. If you need a, a hook up to the Wi-Fi, there's a guest password so you can hook up to it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the youth today, Lord. They've been a blessing to us, Father, as they've done many, much of the work here today, yes. Lord. And now, Lord, they're going to collect the tithe and offerings, Father. And we pray that you'll bless the tithe and offerings, Lord, as we give this unto you, Lord. Give the church uh, leadership, wisdom, and using it for your glory, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs> so I'm going to ask Carlos to step up here. Um, he's going to share, right? You're gonna, well, after the service? Okay. Then sit back down. <laughs> sit back down. <clears throat> All right, let's open up our Bibles then to, let's go to the book of Genesis. If you don't have a Bible, raise your hand and they'll get you a Bible. Uh, make sure that you're reading along with us and you'll see what we're, we're reading as we go along. So we're going to look at Genesis chapter 2, and we're going to look at verses 21 to 25. The theme is Eve. Eve, we all know who Eve is. She is the mother of humanity. And we're going to talk about Eve who God created out of man. It is my belief that many mothers will have a higher position in God's kingdom than many great Christian leaders who might expect to sit at a place of honor. I believe that those men are there because of their mothers. I really do believe that. Think of some of the great men in the Bible, like Moses, or Samuel, or even Timothy in the New Testament. You think of guys like this, and you go, wow, they had some great mothers, right? It was Moses' mother who put him in a basket and saved his life, and then nurtured him, training him in the way of the Lord, and made him such a great man. Where would you be without a spirit-filled mother? What about Augustine, some of our forefathers, or John Newton, or even, even <coughs> people like the Wesleyan brothers? You know, where would they be without their mothers? Or Billy Graham, or even Pastor Chuck, who started the Calvary Chapel movement. Where would they be without their mothers? I remember hearing the story of Pastor Chuck when he was born from the struggle, and his mother promised him to the Lord that she would give him to the Lord if he would spare his life, never telling Pastor Chuck this promise that she made to the Lord. And then later on in life, Chuck, through the Holy Spirit, made a decision to go into full-time ministry. And then she told his son, her son, exactly what happened and how she promised him to the Lord. So where would these men be without mothers? We all need our mothers, and I believe mothers are going to be honored in heaven. And so today we honor mothers. In the book of Genesis that we will be reading here in a moment, it centers around the story of creation, right? The book of Genesis is the book of beginnings. Everything begins from the book of Genesis. Uh, we see the beginning uh, uh, of the heavens and the earth. We see the beginning of creation. We see the beginning of man and woman. We see the beginning of relationship. We see the beginning of government. Everything's in the beginning. In chapter 2 specifically, it describes a time and way that heaven and earth were created. And ultimately... On the seventh day, when God created the heavens and the earth, he rested. Now, he didn't rest because he was tired. He rested as an example to all of us that on the Sabbath day, the holy day, the first day of the week for us Christians, we are to rest. We're to take that day and we dedicate it unto the Lord. He gave us that example. Chapter 2 tells us that Adam was the first human created on earth out of the dust that God created Adam and then breathed life into him. Afterwards, God created the Garden of Eden, and in the Garden, He placed, you know, special trees and fruits and vegetables and all kinds of foliage everywhere. And then He 
told Adam, of this one tree, you're not allowed to eat. He even created animals for him. But then God realized that man was alone, and after creating these animals, he saw that they were not enough. So God created Eve. He took one of Adam's ribs, and he created woman, which we call Eve to this day. Eve was a part of Adam, a part of man. She was created from Adam's own body, the Bible tells us. And this is an essential part of Genesis and why Christians recognize husband and wife in society today. It was through Adam and Eve's union that all can become one flesh as they are wed together. So we have this picture of Eve coming forth from man and becoming the mother of humanity. And I'm going to talk about three points in the scriptures here. One is woman and her role. Two is she is a helpmate. And then three, a mother. So let's read Genesis chapter 2, verse 21 through 25. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam. And he slept. And he took one of his ribs, closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib, which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman. And he brought her to the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And they were both naked, and man and his wife, and were not ashamed. My first point is woman. We notice that God created the woman. It wasn't Adam who created the woman, but it was God who took a rib and created a woman out of his rib. He created her as a woman taken from a man in like manner, in many ways. She is a woman first to God, then a helpmate to her husband, and then a mother to her children. Let me give you that order again. She is a woman first to God because God created her. And then she's a helpmate to her husband. And then a mother to her children. The world's kind of lied to women today. And it's a shame that they have lied to women and what women are to resemble. It's a shame to hear some of the things that are going on today. I remember there was a, a TV program when I was a, a, a young father. And we actually used to to uh, watch it, and I can't remember the name of it, but it was a single mom raising a, a girl, and Tony Danza was in the, in the show too. Who's the, boss? Who's, the boss? who's the boss, right? And I remember the, the young girl, her name, who's now she's on another show that's demonic. Um, what, what's her name? Melissa Milano. Yeah, Melissa Milano. Milano. And she is now a, a um, person that is looked at as part of the feminist movement and she is now calling for a boycott on sex because of the laws that are coming into effect against abortion she has several children and she's telling women to abort their children mm. you know it's a shame to see someone like that grow up into a person like that and then become a spokesman for that type of living to kill innocent babies Innocent babies. And it's sad when we're getting our role models from the world. And as Christians, our role models does not come from the world. Women were made to resemble their creator. That's who we are to look to. How are, how are you as women like your creator? Because God created you in his image. They were created to have a personal relationship with God. First and foremost, as a woman, they are an example to what an intimate relationship looks like with God to their children and to their husbands and to the world. First Timothy 2.9 says this, Women adorn themselves in modest apparel, prosperity and moderation, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly clothing. Now, those things are good. Don't get me wrong. God's not saying you, you shouldn't dress well or nice or look good at all. I used to always laugh with Jay Vernon McGee when he said, look, if the barn needs painting, paint the barn. You know? There's nothing wrong with it. 
I'm not saying that some of you need more pain or, or not. But, you know. <laughs> but Paul, the apostle is telling Timothy here that there are some women that are going overboard. And their hearts are wrong in that, in that uh, type of living. Uh, they should have hearts that are after God first. And he goes on in verse 10 and says, But which is proper for women is professing godliness. So add that to your list of apparel is godliness, you know, how your character is while you dress well, while you look fine, you know, that's okay, but add godliness to it. See, the heart of a godly woman is striving to be like her creator. That is her strive, that is her goal. How can I better, how can she better reflect her creator who created her in his image? And that is an honor for a woman to behave in that manner. Someone said the Christian life is not about all the things we do for God. It's not about being loved by Him, loving Him in return, and walking in intimate union with Him and communion. It's about communion and walking intimately with the Lord. It's not about all even the works that we do for Him. It's about having a personal relationship with God. Ladies, are you walking with the Lord? Are you a mother? Are you a wife that walks with the Lord? Is the Lord first in your life? The Lord was first in Eve's life. The Lord, Lord came first in Eve's life. The Lord, in punishing Adam and Eve, the Lord dealt with Eve by cursing the seed, saying that from her seed, that cursed seed, I'm sorry, that Antichrist will be dealt with. And that Antichrist will be dealt with by the seed that will come from her. And there will be generations from generations. But the blessing that came to her was that she would give birth to the seed that would crush the serpent's head. Antichrist. God dealt with her, dealt with the serpent, and then dealt with Adam in that relationship. Ladies, are you ready to walk with God? Are you living for God? Are you surrendering yourself totally to God? Second point is that she is a helpmate. Now, the word helpmate actually should be M-E-E-T instead of M-A-T because of the definition, and I'll explain that in a minute. In verse 24, we read there, it says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. That speaks of an intimacy with a male figure. And so in this case, Eve with Adam. She is to join with her husband, and they become one flesh. And woman was made from man, and women are just as capable as men are, or not in some situations, but they are equal in every way and form. But there are things that men can do that women can't do, and there are things that women can do that men can't do either. Mm -hmm. But they are to be a helpmate. Women and men are to become one. That is the goal of a woman, is to become one with her husband. That is her responsibility to come alongside him and help him as a help meet. To meet not necessarily his needs, but to help him to be fulfilling in every way so that he can fulfill what God has called in him to do in his life. In Genesis 2.18 it says, The Lord God said, It is not good for man to be alone. It was man that was created first. And then God saw that it was not good for him to be alone. The animals were not enough. He needed something more intimate. And so he brought him a helper. Comparable to him, the Bible says. And uses the word comparable there. Someone to come alongside him and help him so that he can fulfill his call. It was Ezra Benson that said, Women, Woman was not given or was given to man as a helpmate. That complementary association is ideally portrayed in the eternal marriage of our first parents, Adam and Eve. They labored together. This is what they did. They had children together. They prayed together. They taught together. Their children, the gospel message together. This is the pattern God would have all righteous women and men to imitate, is to work together, to train up their children together. They are to be comparable or suitable for one another, the Bible says. A wife is compatible with her husband in many respects, physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. 
a wife is to come along and be physically equal to her husband and meet those physical needs. A wife is to come along and be mentally there for her husband. And many times, many times, uh, a woman understands the mental struggles of life than a man does. I think that God has created them that way to understand mercy and grace, love, connection, emotions, and so forth. And they come along and they help their husbands in those areas. Emotionally and also spiritually. Spiritually. Men should be open to hearing and listening to their wives. Amen. We should be open to that. Yes. They're, they have some wisdom. God has blessed them as they are intimate with the Lord and read and study. You know, it's amazing sometimes. I've learned so much from my wife because of her relationship with the Lord. So they complement each other in marriage. It's kind of like the piano. There's all, all, all kinds of different keys, right? But yet when you play them all together, they sound great. They make great music. And that's how a marriage should be. Uh, the two are suitable for one another. They work together for the same goals. They are progressing to glorify God in training up their kids. So the choice for the woman is to be the helpmate of her husband. And that is a choice. And I know that that is a challenge today because of our society. Because in our society, they tell you, you have your rights and he has his rights. And everything is about dividing and separating you. When God is about uniting you into one, as the Bible says, that we're to become one flesh. In fact, look at the scripture there again. It says, they shall become one flesh. My third point. 1 Corinthians eleven twelve says, For as the woman originates from the man, so also the man has his birth through the woman. And all things originate from God. Through birth, though woman came from the man, though today man comes from the woman through birth. So we have mothers. And we have mothers that are to resemble their Savior as they're worshiping and praising God and as they're helping their husbands, but to resemble a nurturing, loving, caring mother to their children. Amy Carmichael said, you can give without loving but you cannot love without giving. Let me read that again. You can give without loving. There are people that, that give a lot, but they have no love in them at all. They give for the wrong reasons. Maybe they just give because it's a tax write-off. And so I'm giving, but I really don't care about the things that I'm giving to. <clears throat> Maybe it's your service, and you're serving for the wrong reasons. Some people serve for wrong reasons. Some people like to be seen. They have this narcissistic attitude that they want to be seen by other people doing good works. And they might be doing good things and giving things because they're seen. And people say, hey, you're a good person. Hey, I want to be like you. It makes them feel better. And you can give without loving, but you cannot love without giving. When there is love, you will give. And that's a mother. The mother of three spoiled little kids was asked, if you had to do it all over again, would you have children. He says, sure, I would have children again. Of course, they would be different ones, not the same ones. <laughs> the word mother in the Hebrew is em. It's E-M. In the Old Testament, em is translated as mother. It's mentioned 218 times in the Bible. I encourage you moms to look them up, read them, and study the context there uh, to grasp an idea of what a mother is. But it also carries with it the hint of point of departure or division. That's what it means. It's a point of departure or division. It represents a nurturing source from whence those of similar character disseminates or they scatter. They leave. In other words, once they're nurtured, once they have received everything that they possibly could, then it's time for them to scatter and go. See, the mission of a parent is to raise children to follow the Lord. That's our mission as parents. Our first mission is to love God, and that's why a woman is to love God. Our second mission as parents is to love one another in front of our children. <clears throat> and our third mission is to raise children that love God. If we keep just those three principles in front of us at all time, you will do well in life. 
If you keep God first in your personal relationship, and I'm talking about reading, praying, participating in the kingdom of God, serving in church, doing biblical things, living a godly life, not living a wicked and ungodly life, seeking after the kingdom of God and all his righteousness, and then God will add all these other things. If you do all those things and you're surrendering to the Lord, God will bless you for that. But if you add to that a relationship with your spouse, a loving, nurturing relationship, one that is of mutual respect and honor, one that encourages love and displays love to the children, and they see that display of love and compassion for one another, they will see what love truly is. And then if you train your children how to love God, how to love others because you love each other, you will do very well when your children are raised and grown up and they leave they will begin to walk with the Lord and they will begin that process over. That is really our call in life, guys. And of course, to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with so many. So the mission of parents is really to raise children to follow God. God designed the family as a primary unit by which children are cared for, loved, and trained in power. That's what Adam and Eve did. And people oftentimes ask, well, where did all the population come? Well, Adam and Eve... You know, were the first ones to be created. Did God created another family unit? Did God create but no, it was Adam and Eve. And, and they became one and they had children. And then their children married each other and then their children and it populated the earth. Now some of you might think, well that's incest. <laughs> right? And and it's it's true. It is in the definition of incest, but that was God's plan in the beginning. Well why is it illegal now? You know, you don't want to do that. Well it it, it it happens. I mean, I, I've heard of cousins and second cousins getting married, you know, and it's kind of strange when you hear it because of the laws uh, be, that have been brought up because of some of the deformities and DNA mixtures, but that's because of the result of what? Sin, yeah. right? The result of sin, you know, messed up our DNA. That's why we get sick, we get cancer, and we get all those things. In the beginning, everything was pure and perfect. So God could allow us or them at that time to intermarry without any complications at all. And then sin came into the world, Genesis 6, and he had to destroy everything because they were corrupt and wicked and evil. So that's how the earth populated. So Adam and Eve were doing that. And in the, in, in, in the process of doing that, they were teaching their children about the Lord. How do you think Moses heard about the Lord? How about Abraham? How did Abraham hear about the Lord? How could he hear God tell him I want you to leave the land of Ur and you're going to go to the land of Canaan and I'm, and I'm going to promise you to be the father of many. How could he hear that without knowing God? How did they hear, know about sacrifices and offerings? Because Adam and Eve, remember God offered up a sacrifice to cover them, which is a picture of Jesus Christ. And so they took those teachings of God and they told them to their children and their children told them to their children. And so forth. So they passed on the gospel message. And of course, Eve's hope was always for the seed that would come and crush the enemy's head. Right? So she told them about the Messiah that was to come. They had a picture of the Messiah. So the, the family unit has always been the same from the very beginning to train up the children in the way of the Lord. Now this is, a re, this is done by both kindness and discipline. And I mentioned earlier my wife, kindness and discipline... Uh, she was both of those because she was very stern. And if you, I don't know, some of the kids who have had her in class, you know she's pretty stern, right? She don't let you get away with, with much. You know, she tells you, you need, if you need to sit down, you need to sit down, you need to do your work, you need to do your work. That's how she is. But yet, at the same time, she's very kind. You know, I could remember seeing her hugging and kissing her boys. Uh, she would drop them off in school and she would give them a kiss and a hug before they went to class, and so she was very touchy and affectionate towards them, but yet, when they did something wrong, she was very stern. No, you will do this. You will not get away with it. You will suffer the consequences and so forth. And that was a good combination to have to raise boys. We must be parents that do that. A mother must be kind, but still uphold biblical expectations. And she must know when to let go of the children she nurtured. That's a hard thing to do for a mom. 
I don't know if a mom in the heart will ever let go of her children. They are connected uh, forever, it seems like. But yeah, that's what they're called to do. They're called to uphold biblical truths. Here's the thing. And we, we as people don't like this. And I think it's because our parents uh, did not enforce this. <clears throat> and so we grew up with this idea of don't tell me what to do mentality. Don't correct me. You know, don't rebuke me. And yet the Bible tells us the opposite, that we should receive rebuke because yes. we get wiser, you know, when we do receive rebuke. But as parents sometimes, and I kind of blame it back to the 60s, and I'm sure it goes way back because we're dealing with Adam and Eve, so it's always been an issue in, in humanity. So, but I'm blaming it back to the 60s or so when this man wrote a book about how to discipline children. His name was Dr. Spock. Not Star Trek, but it, it was a good doctor. Uh, but he was crazy like that, probably. Never had children. He was telling women how to raise their children. And one of the things that he, he said was, you should not discipline your children. You should not spank them. And so that just took off. Of course, this is a doctor. He's renowned. We should listen to him. He knows what he's talking about. You know, he went to school. He's got a degree and so forth. Hogwash. He doesn't know anything. The Bible says in Proverbs that you should spank a child. Yes. You know? You need to take the rod to them once in a while. I've taken rods to my kids. You know, I've taken belts to their bottoms from time to time. Virginia has too. She's hurt her hand <laughs> many times. <laughs> uh, I could tell you stories. I'm not going to tell you from the pulpit. But, <laughs> <clears throat> but yeah. And I think because of our society, we've grown up with a bunch of wimps today, right? You can't say a thing yeah. against them at all. You can't correct them. We should be people that are willing to be corrected because we know that they're biblical corrections. And if it's biblical, then we should change our mindset to the biblical view. We should train our, train our children that way. You know, I love you, honey, and you're my kid, and you're never going to not be my kid. I will always be with you, but that is not proper behavior for a Christian. That's not how we act. That's not how I act, and I don't expect you to act that way either. And so I love you, but to reinforce this thought that it's wrong, I want you to go and stand in the corner with your nose in the wall, you know, and maybe that will remind you next time. Or I'll write standards out, you know, or if it's bad enough, I want you to go to the room and prepare for the, for the, uh, the seat of knowledge to be you know, hit, <laughs> you know, if it gets that bad. But we must be able to do those things, holding up biblical principles, but yet, Nurturing them and then letting them go, that's a hard, the hardest thing to go. Because how can you let your children go? <clears throat> As most Christian mothers know, it's difficult to balance the, the natural instinct to protect one's child from harm with the necessity to equip them uh, for adult life, too. Very hard to do. Mothers are reminded to love their children, Titus 2.4, to feel affection for them, to approve of them, to like them and to have a kind attitude towards them. All of these things are part of nurturing. Encourage your children. Don't be too negative in your relationship with them. They can be anything they really want to be, if that's what they want to do. Because you know the potential of humankind when God is on their side. They can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens them. So again, the responsibility of the mother to push them. Why we have so many great men of God. At the same time, a mother is to train up a child to live godly lives and discover how they personally can contribute to the kingdom of God. <clears throat> I <clears throat> kind of did something last night when my wife came home from, from a... Um, gathering of her sons with her as, as their mother and one of my sons wrote a letter so I opened it up and I, I read it <laughs> and he went and wrote two pages uh, of all the things that she you know meant to him and he made it very clear in that letter there was a portion of it where he said I can remember and a lot of the letter was I can remember I can remember I can remember and a lot of it was I can remember you taking us to church in the car I can remember you serving with us and we were serving with you I can remember 
dad and I cleaning the toilets and getting them ready for the people that were coming in. And we were training them to serve in the kingdom of God. And that's why they're all servants to this day. <clears throat> that all falls on the parents to train their children because they don't know. You leave a child to themselves and guess what's going to happen? It's a narcissistic attitude. It's all about me. I'm going to do whatever I want. I don't care what you want to do. I don't care what society tells me I should do. I don't care what God tells me to do. That's all sinfulness and it's leading to death. Now it's not an easy task but when you can do it, this is what happens. Proverbs 31, 28. Her children will rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also praise her for her work. You know, Adam and Eve, and I'll close here, they face temptation, just like we face temptation today. But theirs was for the first time. And many of the things that she, they faced were true of them are not true for us. You know, they lived in the perfect environment, uncorrupted from society, right? It was just God and them too. So they didn't have any outside sources to corrupt them except for Satan himself. No family influence uh, could be blamed for their choice to do what was wrong, right? It was, there was no mother or father. They had only God. And God would be given one, one rule. Just don't eat of that tree. Everything else you could enjoy. No sinful heritage could be blamed for their downfall. It's, it's because of them or this or, you know. The, uh, boy, that bugs me. At least, even more so today than ever before when people start blaming other people. You know, when they've done something, they missed it, and they missed the mark, you know, they immediately justify, oh, but you don't understand. No, I understand. You missed it. No, but you don't understand. I, uh, I, no, I get it. I get it. You know, there, <clears throat> there, there were also many sins that Adam and Eve couldn't commit. And I thought that was interesting that they couldn't commit, like, adultery. They couldn't commit adultery. <laughs> there was no one else around. They couldn't steal from anyone else. It was all theirs already. They couldn't dishonor their mother and father because they didn't have a mother and father. They just had God. They couldn't bear false witness against their neighbors, you know. And they couldn't even covet their neighbor's property. So there were a lot of things that they couldn't, couldn't <laughs> sin in. But the essence of sin at the dawn of creation was the same as it is today. They were defiant of God. They were defiant of God, just like we at times are defiant of God. So that's the gospel message, right? All in itself. <clears throat> and this was what Eve taught her children, that you're all defiant, like your father and I. We've all missed the mark. We're all sinners. You know, the Bible says that if you lust for a woman... You committed adultery. <clears throat> so if you're a married man and you ever lust for a woman, you're an adulterer in the heart. You commit adultery. If you're single and you have lusted with a woman or lay with a woman, you are a fornicator, the Bible says. And that will lead you to death in God's economy. Spiritual death, but also physical death. That's the gospel message, is that we are sinners and we fall short of the glory of God. All have sinned. We missed the mark. That's all the word means. I've missed the mark. What's the mark? God's commandments. He's given us ten, and you should follow them. And one of them is honor your father and mother. And yet at times we have not honored our father and mother. We fall guilty there also. That's the gospel message. And here is the good news. Because we're being led to death because of our sins, God had a plan. And he told Eve, the plan is that I will, through your seed, send the Messiah, and he will crush the work of the enemy. So if you put your faith in Jesus Christ alone, which means you're going to believe, you're going to clean, you're going to turn from your sins, you will become born again. And God will give you a new life. But you must be born again in order to enter the kingdom yes. of God. That's what the Bible says. Nicodemus came to Jesus. And Jesus didn't even hear him. He said, Nick, you have to be born again. I don't care how much religious stuff you do. I don't care how much you know about the Old Testament. You know, I don't care how much you serve with the religious leaders. You have to be born again, Nick. And he didn't understand it. Jesus said, you have to be born of the Spirit. And so you need to allow the Spirit to come in you in order to change you. And so Peter said, it's not the circumcision of the flesh which that's what the Jews thought, you know, let's just follow some rules. And sometimes Christianity can be that to set many of us as just rules and regulations. Well, it's not. It's a circumcision of the heart. 
Everything we do is about the heart. I don't care what you're doing. Even standing behind here has to be about my heart being right before the Lord. Not doing this because I want to be seen. And not doing it because I want to please man, but I'm going to share the truth because I want to please God. So a matter of the heart. When you do something, why are you doing it? If you're not doing it, why is it that you're not doing it? Why are you de being defiant? Why are you fighting against it? Is it because you're not getting what you want? Then you are narcissistic. It's all about you. It's all about you. That's all you really care about is you. And then you fall back to the Old Testament, and it's all about you becoming God, because that's what the serpent tempted Eve with. He's afraid that if you eat of this tree, you'll be God like him. And that's our fault. Every one of us deals with that every single day, wanting to be God. And we're in defiance of God himself. And we're telling God how we're going to live our lives. Instead of saying, Lord, I want to live according to your will. Let me surrender to you. That's easy remedy because Jesus went to the cross and he died upon that cross and he resurrected from the dead. And if we believe that Jesus died for our sins and that he resurrected from the dead, we will have eternal life. If I can ask the group to come forward. <clears throat> You know, as mothers, this message of the gospel, your children should be the first ones you tell the gospel to. There should come a time in their life where you sit them down and you share with them what the gospel is. Same with fathers. You share with them. You lead them to the Lord. That is your responsibility. That is your responsibility. You know, it, it may not be that that moment is when they're born again, but that is a responsibility you have. I remember, I think it was my older son, uh, we met, led him all to the Lord, but it wasn't until later on in his life where all of a sudden God really spoke to him and challenged him if he was willing to surrender his life completely to the Lord. But the foundation was laid there, and when that time came for him to be born again, he was ready. And that's the responsibility of, of moms. Let's bow our heads. And maybe this message this morning has ministered to you and touched your heart and made you realize that you need Jesus in your life. Uh, maybe you just realize I need to just get right with the Lord because I've been living for myself. You know, and if, you're, if you have not come to a personal relationship with Jesus, then you have no relationship with God at all. You can say you know God all you want, but if you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus, you don't know God. And so you need a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And it's the only way that you're going to have access to the Father in heaven is through Jesus Christ. And you must repent and turn from your sins. And then God said, I will raise you up in the last days. So just say this prayer if you need Jesus in your heart. Lord Jesus, I am a sinner and I fall short of your standards, Lord. I have broken them, Lord. I know that I'm guilty. And I need a Savior. And I know that Jesus is the Savior of the world. He's the Messiah. And He came to give me life. And I want to believe in Him. Help me to believe in Him. Help me to surrender my life to Him, Lord. Come into my heart. Be my God. Be my Savior. Give me eternal life. And fill me with your Holy Spirit. And help me, Lord, to surrender my life to you daily. As I read your word, that I will be obedient to it. As you lead me and guide me, Lord, in it. Lord, would you bring me into the family of God and change my life. And I pray this with all my heart. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Let, let's stand and we'll close with this and then Carlos is going to say a few words. Hi everyone. Um, again, my name is Carlos. You know who I am. I'm the youth servant. I don't like word leader. Really. I just uh, help out the kids. Put them all together. So today is our second youth service, right? Since last month. We do this every single month. And so we are rock solid as you guys can see up there. And, and uh, we were seriously blessed last time uh, with your support and donations. 
Uh, today we are having a, like a little bit of a bake sale. We have uh, Manny's World Famous uh, Family's surprise, uh, Secret Banana Nut Bread. So if you haven't had it, it's made by scratch. It's not bought, store bought, okay? We're selling it by the slice and uh, also a loaf. So uh, go outside, they'll see that. Um, and then we're also gonna ask for a love offering. Again, a love, a love offering is just anything you want.